את האורח שלנו הפעם ממש אין צורך להציג. שלום מאסטרו. שלום אריק. I'm holding a book in my hands, published in the year 2007. Life and death of classical music, written by I'm Mr. for life. <laughs> Mr. Librecht. What's your opinion? Death of classical music? Well, he takes a negative view. I don't subscribe to that at all. I, I must think that classical music, the word classical means it doesn't die. What is classical? That which does not die. So it's a contradiction in terms. Maybe he refers to the industry? To the music well, maybe industry. he's referring to records or something like that. But when people want to go to concerts, they are always going. In page 138, I suppose, there is something beautiful in this book. You'll love it, I'm sure. It says that Zubin Mehta sold 10 million records. You are in the list of world records. Well, it's news to me. <laughs> two lines below Toscanini. Uh -huh. So where are the royalties? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see them. You have to talk to your manager. Yeah. Ten million. I can't believe that. This gentleman also wrote another book, at the end of which he quoted my salary of, of the year. This is also fantasy. It's, it's, it's not your salary. No. So your salary is much higher, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> your salary here in Israel. No, he you put know. the three... Uh, biggest earners of classical music. <laughs> It was about 10 years ago. I mean, I hardly know him, <laughs> so I don't... He, Pavarotti, Itzhak, and Meta. Okay. Now, I don't know about the other two, but my, my figure was completely exaggerated. You know, I've been thinking about the 10 million copies. I thought the following. Suppose a conductor conducts uh, for 50 years. Fair enough. Yeah. His career lasting 50 years. 100 concerts a year. Uh, which means he can reach, uh, averagely, never more than three million listeners in his life. That's possible. That's possible, especially with the television audience and the audiences that, in, for instance, in New York, when we play in Central Park every summer, each concert has about 100, yeah, 200,000 yeah, people. Yeah. So that also counts. And 10 million also probably... If he counts the three tenors, maybe ten, because <laughs> they sold many. Yeah, but I've been thinking, you play, you conduct every night, every night. In and Israel. Then, yeah, in, elsewhere also. And then you reach altogether never more than two, three million people with park concerts. And here, just in selling CDs, you reach ten million. Yeah, but, uh, you know, recently... I opened a website, finally, with my family and my secretary pushing me. I said, okay, let's do it. And they compiled a list of my recordings. Even I was shocked how many I have done since 1966. So it's a long time, too. What's your opinion about DVDs? Making a concert on the screen. DVDs of operas can bring a lot of people great pleasure because of the close-ups of the singers, because of the clarity of the text, because uh, of the new sound that comes out. Uh, I'm now doing a DVD of my Ring production in Valencia, and the first results are really magnificent in high definition. The photography is wonderful. So that helps, I think. I thought that a Bruckner symphony for television is hopeless. Even if you start Greek concerto yeah. with a timpani and you do all that. You know, I'm the wrong person to ask this because I don't see those things. Uh, not even mine. Uh. But on the other hand, when you did, for instance, Mahler's second on top of Metzada, yeah. that's for television. Or when Lenny did on the walls of Berlin. Yes, those nice. are occasions. occasions. Those are happenings. And besides occasion, just a long symphony. Yeah, well, I production. don't push that either. Uh, now, we're not making real recordings anymore. We are recording for DECA, again, after many years, but for downloading purposes. We deliver them the whole package, and they are publishing it uh, on the Internet. Uh, many conductors played the piano. 
you played the double bass, I suppose. I used to play piano also, <laughs> but uh, double bass. I learned the double bass in order to play in the orchestra in my youth to see the conductor from the other side. Also, to play in an orchestra is the most wonderful education. So we have a small surprise for you, Maestro Meta playing the double bass. It's not that I like to see myself playing, but to see my adopted sister, Jacqueline Dupre, playing with this kind of verve. Those two little phrases showed everything about her. But these two little phrases show your skills as a double bass player. <laughs> this is the most famous <laughs> double bass solo in the whole composition. Yeah. <laughs> it took us much time to, to find, find it. it. <laughs> Ah, uh, you are a great double bass player. I was no, wondering no, no. whether during the rehearsal once when you wanted to show them how to play the role, you took the double bass and just say to them, do what I do. You are yeah, better than me. <laughs> you never demonstrated no, to them. No. Because I heard about conductors who would just uh, take the trombone and show them how to play the trombone. No, no. I heard about... I'm more humble than that. <laughs> but to listen to the music, from downstairs, from the double bass, uh, is a good education. Well, when you consider that the entire Viennese school is built on a bass line, uh, it helps a lot to know the bass line. I played in my youth, I really once played the Beethoven Ninth really by heart on the bass. <laughs> Until today, I know the whole bass line. Uh, and uh, it was a great education for me, the few years that I spent in Vienna studying and playing bass in different orchestras. In churches, I played a lot of Haydn masses, Mozart masses on the loft in the church on Sunday mornings. These were all very educational experiences. And you studied conducting formally only in Vienna, never yes. before in... Well, my father taught me a little bit in India when I would accompany him at rehearsals. And who was the teacher in Vienna? Hans Swarovski. Oh, a great teacher. Yes. He was the teacher of conductors of the 50s, 60s, until he passed in the middle 70s. And his background from both Richard Strauss and Schoenberg, Webern, brought incredible insight to us. And that brings us to the real question, can you really teach conducting? What can you teach, but don't No, you teach music. You, you analyze. Uh, you have to have an incredible knowledge of the man, the composer, of his techniques. You cannot do a Mozart symphony if you don't know his operas. And you can't do his operas if you don't know his chamber music. So it's all one. And he showed us the complete picture, always relating to the Renaissance painting world. The art of conducting is a very strange art. Is mainly in communication or what is it? It is mainly communication, but communication of ideas through knowledge. This is succinctly put. Knowledge is knowledge of style, knowledge of the orchestra, knowledge of the sound, knowledge of phrasing. And if you have a conception that you can convince 150 or 115 musicians, especially Jews, <laughs> you've accomplished something. Jew. You know, this month we played a symphony of Bruckner, which is a completely a sound coming from the world of Wagner, and then we play two operas of Verdi. That's an another sound. Now, in Verdi, sometimes influenced by Wagner's world, although he didn't appreciate Wagner too much, there's still a little Verdi coming into the end of Aida. Uh, and one has to know when to draw that out. And one has to know the texture of a Verdi. And our orchestra is so flexible, they can do both. Do you believe that every hand of any conductor could produce different sound from the orchestra? 
Well, it depends what you have developed with your musicians as communication. My orchestra here knows with my gesture, even without speaking sometimes, what I want. And if, if I don't get it, then that's what rehearsals are for. Now, for instance, we have new musicians coming in, mostly from ex-Soviet Union. They don't have the Wagnerian weight in the sound. We have to develop that, of course. You are not teaching conducting like Swarovski, you teach her on a permanent basis, no, but from no. time to time you give master classes. Very few. One of them was in Israel. Yes. Do you remember it? Ah, uh, yes. Not very happy experience. Thank you very much. Can Except start? the horns, it sounded beautiful. <laughs> yes. Why are you going on? There's not one bar together. <laughs> Okay, okay, just a moment, just a moment. You, you played it through one. Don't now again play it through because you're wasting time. <clears throat> Fix the first violence. You were slightly torturing the guy. Well, I have to provoke him to, to, to get something out of him uh, because otherwise young kids, they just keep on conducting. And I was, I, my... Preoccupation was that he was not rehearsing. I told them that this is your first rehearsal of this piece for the concert. So if you keep on playing through and uh, letting, you don't have that much time. Uh, a conductor must be able to calculate the time that he is given. You have two and a half hours or three hours with an intermission and you have to accomplish a certain amount. So you must come to the core of the problem immediately. I suppose that during rehearsal you never insult your players. It's forbidden no. today. Is it forbidden? Because I remember in the old days the, the conductors like Toscanini used to scold and to... Yeah, but he would do it with an American orchestra in Italian. So they didn't <laughs> understand most of it, <laughs> what he was saying. But, but no, you... why should I insult? Sometimes I get irritated. And I'll tell you what irritates me. A lack of love for what the musician is doing, or lack of concentration, a mistake everybody can have. But when I see a musician not caring or not loving, when he's playing a second movement of a Schubert symphony, and I think, my God, there are people who would give their life to play this phrase, and this person is blasé. This irritates me a lot. This is what makes me angry at a rehearsal, and also at a concert. The conductors today are the real kings of this scenario. They choose the orchestra, they choose the players, they choose the soloists, they choose the repertoire, they commission new works. They just dominate the situation. Well, we do it uh, not alone. I don't do these things alone. I have always a group of advisors with me, in this case with the Israel Philharmonic with musicians, uh, so whenever we pick a musician, it is with the consensus of the committee. Uh, rarely do I say to the whole committee, I don't care what you're saying, I want them or her. No, it doesn't happen. Because we all want the best person possible. Uh, so it is done uh, democratically, actually. With my opinion, which uh, I gracefully <laughs> try to convince them. It's a lot of responsibility. Yes, it is. If something is it's wrong... It's something I personally enjoy. Because, as I said, my door is open to suggestions from my, from my colleagues. Even at rehearsals, when a musician comes to me and says, look, can we do it this way or that way? If it doesn't bother with my entire concept, I'm very flexible about that. And with singers too. When you see a singer who is convincingly uh, portraying either a character, which you have not thought of, like, for instance, the great Ruggiero Raimondi, you do with him a Tosca, he sings Scarpia, and I said, well, I never thought of the phrase that way. And let him do it. So I'm flexible. In you, other words, I don't have to dominate from, I'm not a control freak in that sense. You are a great opera conductor. Do you prefer to be in the pit or on stage? No, I've done both. And that was the advantage of with my teacher. He was also a symphony and opera conductor. What's the difference between these two kinds of conducting, opera and being conducted? It is different. The adagio of the Eroica has a 
construction that if the conductor doesn't know exactly where he's going, because the theme is very slow and very long. The theme is played by the violins, then echoed by the oboe. Then the second part comes back to the violins. By the time the theme is over, it's already over five minutes. Now, if a conductor doesn't know where he's going, you're lost. People are sleeping in the audience. And you have to also provoke and inspire the musicians to, to, do, to keep that line. In an opera situation, when you're doing a second act of Valkyrie, excuse me, <laughs> <laughs> and Wotan is narrating practically the whole story of the ring, can get also very tedious if you don't help him move it and help him um, s tell his story, which is very quietly composed by Wagner, tell his story in an exciting manner with all the little motives going on in the orchestra. This you have to control. You mentioned the Eroica. And I thought, first symphony by Beethoven is less than half an hour. Second symphony, less than half an hour. And then comes Eroica, suddenly, almost one hour. You need some personality for that. Well, the Eroica is the point in Beethoven's life that he takes off. From the Eroica to the end. There's not one weak moment in Beethoven's life. It suddenly, it happens to other composers too. That's the composition that uh, puts his signature for the rest of his life. Everybody almost can conduct Beethoven first and second, but what kind of conductor you need for the Eroica? A man who knows what happens before. A man who knows Haydn and also Mozart. You have to know where Beethoven is coming, because Beethoven is like Michelangelo. He takes the classical period to its height with the Eroica, and then lays the foundation stone of the Romantic era. And in Fidelio, you have everything. You start like Haydn, and by the uh, prelude of the second act, you are already, he is inventing Wagner. So, it's like Michelangelo, with the Pietà, it's the height of the Renaissance, and then he paints the Sistine Chapel, which is already the great Romantic era, the Baroque, you see? And these, there are certain composers who are, find themselves on the hinge of time. Schoenberg, the same thing. Schoenberg takes Wagner with the Guru leader to its absolute height. You can't do anything after the Guru leader. He breaks it down and comes out Twelve years later, in the desert, he's wandering, and the twelve-tone system uh, emanates from him. And the rest of the world takes over from him. These are these hinge composers. You were born in Bombay. Yes. In Israel, we say today, we started to say Mumbai. Mumbai. You know? In my language, we say Mumbai. Yeah, yeah, that's what I heard. So, you were born in Mumbai. Mumbai. And you started to love classical music by listening to records or how? Records and my father. My father had a quartet. My father was the concert master of the Bombay Symphony and then also conducted it. Uh, when my father would prepare a concert, he would have sections coming to the house. We would have second violin rehearsals in my house. <laughs> the and viola <laughs> rehearsals in my house. Uh, and then you went to college. Uh, I went to pre-medical college mm -hmm. in Bombay. Mm -hmm. In Mumbai. Mumbai. Yeah. Mumbai, and I think we have some surprises for yeah. you. Maestro Zubin Meta, I was a student in college Saint Xavier for a year. Hello. Very nice. The visit to college, after so many years, הוא רגע מיוחד לסטודנטים ולזובין מטה כאחד. So beautiful. The college. The college, yes. Built by Jesuits in this neo-Gothic style. But Bombay's architecture is unique in the world because British architects would try to combine European styles with a little of Indian cliches. Our railway station in Mumbai is the biggest neo-Gothic monument that you've ever seen, with gargoyles like in Gothic churches, but with Indian cliches also. 
your house is very beautiful, your family was yeah. well to do. Our market in Mumbai was built by Rudyard Kipling's father. Oh, really? Also, yeah. Oh. Uh, you know, I visited Mumbai and Pune, and I played for your Parsi a community. Yes. And everybody told me they went to class together with you. It was a large class. And they probably said they're all my relatives, yes, too. Yes, yes. <laughs> But, Eric, you played with me the first time here in 1962, Schumann Concerto. I never forget. You know, when I first came, that was 61. 61. I had three Israeli soloists here. It was you, Chaim Taub, and uh, Judy Lieber played with uh, uh, Uri Shocham, I think. Yeah, the Mozart, yeah, the Mozart. Flute and harp. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, my, my first visits to Israel is to me like yesterday. It's unforgettable. I remember the rehearsals even of the first program because I'd conducted the program for the first time and the few of the pieces were the first time for the orchestra too. So I didn't have the situation of an orchestra knowing it by heart and the young conductor, you know, swimming. But Stravinsky Symphony in Three Movements, they didn't know it, and I was doing it for the first time. So it was advantage to me. I must tell you about my terrible disappointment. I was supposed to play with Eugene Ormandy, Schumann Concerto. Yeah, of course. And this was the dream of my life, to play with I'm the sorry. famous Eugene Ormandy. And <coughs> just two, three days before the concert, they told me that Eugene Ormandy is ill. And a young Indian and a conductor. <laughs> Schwarz is coming to take his <laughs> to place. To replace him. And you came and you conducted Schumann Concerto by heart. How you learned it in two days, I don't no, know. No, no, I didn't learn it in two days. But you knew it. It was... You really... Only, it was the second time I was doing it. You really knew it. Yeah. And it was so gorgeous. And then the orchestra invited you again and again and you became... Well, that is the proof of the success that a young conductor needs. He has to be invited again. Everybody gets a first chance through, like, it was a chance. Ormond is sick, I'm doing nothing in Vienna, half the years about me from somewhere, I don't know. They send me a telegram, I didn't even know which orchestra it was. Because a telegraphic address they signed, Pal Phil Ork. I said, what is this orchestra? But I said, yes. <laughs> Do you know some good young conductors today? Yes. Yeah, well, you know, we introduced this young boy from Venezuela a couple of years ago, Gustavo Dudamel. Yep. He is now like a rocket. Uh, there, are some, there are some fine Israeli conductors. But I still yeah. recall Zubin Mehta as a young conductor. If Dudamel is a rocket, so you were... Well, you see, we called him back also. And I'm always trying young Israeli com uh, conductors. Uh, yeah, Yaron Traub is doing very well in Valencia. Uh, there's young Volkov. We are inviting them in the future. Uh, we have to give them chances. I thought of the energy you need for conducting. And I made again little statistics. Suppose you move your arms twice in a second. <laughs> <laughs> that m means... 7,200 yeah. in one hour. Don't scare me. <laughs> Which means 30,000 in a rehearsal and in a normal day of conducting. Now, that's beyond the capacity of an athlete. It's called adrenaline. <laughs> yeah, but how can you do it? If you ask me to just to do it now, <laughs> I'll be tired after five movements. But the first act of Goethe Demerung lasts two hours. And you're not tired. In the past 24 hours, I think you conducted in two cities, New York and Jerusalem. Well, I'll tell you what. Sunday night was Haifa, Aida. Monday was United Nations, Beethoven Fifth. Tuesday was Aida in Jerusalem. And last night, Aida in Tel Aviv. So it was four cities. <laughs> and after uh, New York, you just went directly to the airport. Yes. Yeah. Can you yeah. sleep during flights? Yes. Yes, uh, I have no problems. And I don't suffer from jet lag. Because jet lag is not a sickness. You cannot it's afford a condition, it. It's a condition, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you feel sleepy.
You simply cannot afford it. In fact, before this interview started, I couldn't stop yawning. And I have not <laughs> yawned once. This is adrenaline. So why do they cough so much in the concert? Because they're not conducting. <laughs> when I'm sick, and I've been very sick with colds, I go on the stage, I don't sneeze anymore. How is that possible? There's something here that stops me. That lets you move As soon up. as I come off the stage, I'm sneezing. As soon as this interview finishes, I will start yawning. Your day, starting in the morning, rehearsing, then in the afternoon, meetings. Yeah, but we haven't mentioned one thing. I love it. <laughs> it's love that does it. It's the, I want to. I cannot wait tonight to conduct Don Carlo. Tonight is Don Carlo. Yes. I can't wait. I have wonderful singers. I have an orchestra that learned it from scratch. They are playing it so beautifully. Don Carlo is absolutely, I think, my favorite Verdi opera. It is a wealth of melodic invention that I don't find in, even in Otello or Falstaff, like that. They are genial operas, but Don Carlo is wave after wave of melodies. You know, a young uh, page in the opera comes and says, here's the Marquis de Posa. The four bars of introduction of Marquis de Posa is a theme that he never uses again. And it's the most beautiful theme. I know why Don Carlo is your favorite opera. You know why? Because you are conducting it tonight. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> so, Possibly. So we wish you to break a leg tonight. And thank you so much for coming to us. Well, the time passed too soon. Zubin, it's always wonderful being with you. Pleasure. Thank you so much. אני מכיר הרבה כנרים שהחליטו להפסיק לנגן. שמעתי גם על פסנתרנים רבים וצ'לנים שהחליטו להפסיק לנגן. אבל מנצחים לא. הם מנצחים תמיד עד יומם האחרון. כולם. ואנחנו מאחלים למאסטרו שלנו שימשיך וימשיך וימשיך ויגרום לנו הרבה אושר כתמיד.